We are in Colossians part three today, which means we are going to be in verses 21 through 23 of chapter one. So that's Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And we're going to get straight into it. It says this, and you were at one time strangers and enemies in your minds as expressed through your evil deeds. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy without blemish and blameless before him. If indeed you remain in the faith, established and firm without shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has also been preached in all creation under heaven. And I, Paul, have become its servant. Tonight, I want to share a message with you titled The If. The if is the title of the message tonight, and you may return to your seat with that being said. The if. What is the if? Oh, we're going to show you. But first, I want to do this. I want to shift around these verses to help provide clarity. How many of you have ever gotten really excited about something, and you started telling somebody information about this something, but you didn't explain to them the context of the information first? Have you ever done that? And sometimes it can get a bit confusing because now they're caught up on the subject matter, but you haven't given them the context. And so you got to go back real quick and write in the context because you were just so pumped about the subject. That's kind of what happened here with Paul. All right. So I'm going to move around some of the pieces of this passage to help reorient the focus and the context of what he's saying. I'm not going to change the Bible here. OK, listen to me. I'm not changing the Bible. OK, Indy, I'm not changing the Bible. I'm just moving stuff around. All right. So let's, let's read it like this. I, Paul, you don't have to stand. I, Paul, have become a servant of the gospel. This gospel has been preached in all creation under heaven that you were at one time strangers and enemies in your minds as expressed through your evil deeds, but now Christ has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy without blemish and blameless before him. And this is true for you if indeed you remain in the faith established and firm without shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Now, before we get into breaking this into pieces and explaining the if, I want to go back and rehash some of the context of this passage in general. At the very beginning of Colossians, we shared with you a little bit about the book of Colossians. Some of you were here, some of you weren't, just in case you weren't here or just in case you missed it online. Um, this book is written to believers, specifically in Colossae, all right? So this is book is written to believers, specifically in Colossae. Number two, Colossae was a place that Paul had not actually been to. Instead, one of his disciples, uh, Epaphras, had planted the church. So of all of the epistles that are written in the New Testament, those are the books that are written to the churches, this is the only one written to a church that it seems that Paul never actually visited personally. Epaphras, who was one of his disciples, was the one who established this church in Colossae. The third thing we need to think about is this. The early church, much like today, was full of false teachers who preach enticing messages that fall short of the gospel. If you guys are on social media at all, I know you've seen some of these people, especially if you're on TikTok, that toxic wasteland. If you're on TikTok, you have seen these TikTok preachers. And I'm just waiting for one of them to hit the nail on the head. You know what I'm saying? I've got, I got to the point where I disappeared from TikTok after being on it for like a week because I was like, this is so toxic. I don't even think I can sneak into it, right? It's so messed up. Just like today, there were many false teachers back then as well, and they were preaching these enticing messages, but those messages fall short of the gospel. Here, the Apostle Paul is clarifying a few things. First, he's clarifying what the fundamental truth of the gospel is, that you were lost, that you were strangers, that you were enemies of God. But because of Christ's death and resurrection, you have been granted the opportunity to be in relationship with him and be seen as holy if you will receive him as Lord. That is the basic general gospel. What he's also doing here is he's confirming the gospel that's been preached by Epaphras, which they had heard. It would be easy for these people to look at Epaphras and be like, well, how do we know to trust you in comparison to anybody else? It's not like you're the Apostle Paul. But what they didn't realize because they hadn't met Paul is that Paul's signature was on Epaphras himself. The importance of making disciples comes down to this. 
that when I know who is being discipled, I can vouch for their quality. This modern day movement, and I wanna shout out this warning because it's important. The whole idea of saying that you're non-denominational sounds enticing, but it's something we should also be wary of because we don't know where they came from. If you don't know what gospel they received, how can you know that the gospel that they teach is true? If they're not connected to anything that is firmly rooted and grounded in something that is consistent and true, then you should be worried. The whole idea that we're drawn toward non-denominationalism should actually be a sign of a red flag to the church. Number one, that our denominations are out of line. And that number two, that we're actually going to the people who have no real backing. That's a bad situation. We need to be connected to something. We need to be rooted in something. We can't just get up in the morning and decide we're gonna do the gospel our own way, amen? So that's a good thing to write down. One day you're gonna be an adult. One day you're gonna have to shop for a church. You need to be concerned with where the gospel came from that they are preaching from their pulpit. Please, please write this down. Be concerned with where the gospel came from that your pastor is preaching from their pulpit. Be concerned with where they got their credentials. Do you know that there are a bunch of people who call themselves pastors and reverends that all they did was they went online, they paid $15, and they got out a printout copy that said that they're ordained or that they're licensed or that they're credentialed through whatever agency online. Nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows what they believe, but they went online and got a $15 credential. Yeah, it's the quick way to be able to go and marry people in Vegas. You can just hop in a wedding chapel, dress up like a cowboy and get people married and make money for it. So for $15, you can go and get yourself some fraudulent credentials. So to say that I'm ordained doesn't mean anything. You're ordained by whom and what does that group believe and why did they ordain you and what qualifies you? These are reasonable questions to concern yourself with And it wasn't out of line, even for the people in Colossae to be concerned with these things. And I think that's part of why Paul is validating here. He's validating Epaphras. The next thing that he's letting them know is this, is that the same gospel has spread all over the world. That this isn't just a localized gospel with a localized church. It was easy back then because people couldn't travel so easily and because we didn't have the internet where people are all connected, where you can figure out what's going on in Ukraine just like that. You can figure out what's going on in Hawaii just like that. You never even have to visit, but you know what's going on there. That wasn't available back then. And so it would be easy to see that this church planted here was just how the church was. But how many of you know there's even churches in our own city that you should not go to, that you should not trust? Churches in our own city. And if that's the only church you had ever gone to, how would you know the difference? And so Paul is here saying that this gospel has actually traveled the world. This isn't just a localized gospel as some of these teachings were. He also was letting them know that they hadn't been left out of the loop of the church. You must understand that the enemy will use your FOMO and use your insecurities to deceive you. I always say this, that only the creator can create. But the enemy is crafty enough to use what is already at his disposal. Your insecurities are a perfect breeding ground for deceit. Your FOMO is a perfect breeding ground for deceit. If you ask people to reflect on when they were in high school, the times where they went to parties, nine times out of 10, they'll tell you the reason that they went was because they had fear of missing out. And they pretend like they don't regret it. Everything happens for a reason. Let me make something clear. Everything does not happen for a reason. But thank goodness we have a great God who gives reason to everything that happens, even though not everything happens for a reason. That is important for you to understand. Write that down. Not everything happens for a reason. Not everything happens for a reason. And write this. But God in his goodness gives reason to everything that happens. God in his goodness gives reason to everything that happens. You need to be careful of those people who want to let you in on the big secret. Because the gospel isn't. 
Be careful about those who want to let you in on a big secret. Because just because it's the new gospel don't mean it's the true gospel. There's a lot of men preaching one-liners, taglines, putting up memes of little things that they're saying. And it sounds good at first glance. It looks good. And then you compare it to the word and you find out it's nothing like the word. There are a few notable pieces to what we would call true gospel. Number one, we are all born strangers and enemies of God. The first thing you need to understand about the gospel is that we are all born strangers and enemies of God. Why? Because Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, part of the curse of that sin was that we would be born into a fleshly nature. Though we were created as beings of the spirit, the spirit within us because of sin would be dead. And that's why we were separated with God. The Bible tells us that God is spirit, and as a result, his people must worship him in spirit and truth. So since our spirit is dead, we're separated from him. We are people of the flesh. God is not of the flesh, and that is the separation. So number one, you need to understand that. There are people preaching today in churches that would call themselves Christian that we are all naturally good, that we are not naturally sinners. And while this seems accepting, it is not true. Do you want to know how you can tell it's not true? Simple. Your proclivity towards sin. Most of us, if we were being honest, and this is actually troubling, most of us, if we're being honest, would say, we sin more often than we're holy. That's the proof that we are naturally fallen and separated from the goodness of God. Number two, Everybody can measure this by the evil deeds. We call it judging. How, how many of you have noticed the world is pushing back really hard against anybody who judges anybody? Why? Because they know they're in sin when they get judged. You know what doesn't get judged? Holiness. In fact, the Bible tells us this, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-discipline. And against these things, there is no law. What it's saying is, if you produce the fruit of the Spirit, you will not be judged. But if you produce anything other than the fruit of the Spirit, you can almost guarantee that judgment is coming your way. So don't be upset when you get what you asked for. Don't be upset when you get what you paid for. Because when I sin and somebody calls me out, it's not their problem, it's my problem. Only difference is now I actually got to deal with it. Nobody wants to deal with their problems. They don't want to deal with the fact that they hate themselves, so instead they wear the opposite gender's clothing. They don't, they don't want to deal with the fact that they're miserable, so instead they just kill themselves. They don't want to deal with the fact that they're wrong, so instead, they just get a divorce. They don't want to deal with the fact that they put themselves in a compromising situation so they abort the baby. Oh, but nobody's allowed to say anything because that's judgmental. No, there is a price for sin. And you can either deal with the judgment now or you can deal with the judgment later. It's one or the other. But judgment is coming. And your evil deeds are the proof that you are fallen and separated from God naturally. However, the good news is this, that we can be reconciled to God by way of Christ's death as a man on the cross. You need to understand that Jesus was not just 100% God. He was also 100% man. So that also means we can't write off Jesus things as just Jesus things. It means he was just as much our example as he was our Savior. As a man, 100%, he died on that cross and was raised again to life by way of the Spirit to fulfill the atonement necessary for you to live in relationship with God just as was intended in the beginning. And we need to understand this, that we are not only saved by this act, but through this, we can be called holy and blameless when we stand before God. Even in the times where we do fall short, because of our position of repentance and humility, we can receive the title of holy and blameless. 
nothing that we ever earned, but was given to us free of charge by the death and resurrection of Jesus. But there is an if. There is an if to that shift from death to life. There is an if from that stranger to friend relationship. There is an if from the enemy to the son. There is an if. What is the if? Before we get into the if, I want you to write this down. The key to unlock the if is remain. The key to unlock the if is remain. Where do we see this? We see this right there toward the end of this passage in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23a, the first half of verse 23. It says, if indeed you remain, if indeed you remain in the faith, established and firm without shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. One more time. Can we actually read this together? Is that cool? Can we read this together? Can you read with me? I know it might seem weird. You're probably like sitting in a coffee shop and then have your headphones in or something, but can you? Okay, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. If indeed you remain in the faith, established and firm, without shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Good job, guys. Give yourself a hand and return to your seats. Now, how many of you remember in the summer school series, how many of you, first of all, were here for the summer school series? Were you here for that? In summer school, how many of you remember when we talked about Calvinism and Arminianism and then Molinism and all that kind of stuff? We talked about all those isms. Yeah, that was a lot of like intense, like doctrinal stuff. I had one of my leaders actually telling me that essentially it was like spiritual quantum physics that I was explaining. And I'm like, yeah, I know what that is. That sounds brilliant. And I'm... I guess that guy, I got you. What's, what do you mean quantum physics and how does this align with it? I don't know. Uh, but that was, a fantastic, that was a fantastic time. I'm actually gonna go in one more time uh, e explaining a little bit in regard to the viewpoint of Calvinism. Calvinism, to explain it briefly, is how scripture is bent to say that we, don't, that we don't have free will under the fear that free will somehow impacts God's sovereign authority and will. It's people who are like, no, you actually don't totally have free will because God is determinative and that means that he makes decisions for you and it kind of looks like free will, but it's not actually free will because you're just choosing what he tells you to choose. Now, the logical conclusion to that belief is actually really problematic. If evil didn't come from man's sin, then evil was authored by God himself, which means that God is evil. And on top of that, sadistic. Especially when you consider that that would mean that he always planned to have the son tortured and killed. And on top of that, he's immoral in that he creates some for the express purpose of damning them to separation from him. I knew you were, before you were born, I knitted you together in your mother's womb and you're going to hell because I already decided you are. If you're a Calvinist, you can try to jump through flaming hoops. But the fact is, you have got to say that you believe that. Because if you believe that everything originates from the throne of God, then you believe that he is the author of evil, that he is the one who planted the seed of evil, that he is the one who told humanity to commit evil, that he is the one who planned and authored the death and torture of the son, and that he actually creates people just for fun to watch them burn. I'm just saying, I don't believe in that God. I'll say it on camera. I don't believe in that God. Because that isn't the God of the Bible. Now, let me be clear. I don't believe in a wimpy, weak, lovey-dovey Jesus. 
I believe in a just, all-powerful God, but I do not believe that God is evil or the author of evil because I read the freaking Bible. Want to know what the Bible says? I'll tell you what the Bible says. Exodus chapter 34, verse five through seven. It says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the Lord by name. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in goodness and faithfulness, keeping faithful love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But he by no means leaves the guilty unpunished, responding to the transgression of fathers by dealing with children and children's children to the third and fourth generation. First Chronicles 16, 34 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his faithful love endures forever. Psalm 25, eight says, good and upright is the Lord. Psalm 145, nine, the Lord is good to who? All. All. But I thought he damned some to hell from the very beginning. The Bible is a liar or Calvinists are wrong. I don't know. It's up to you. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. All of them. Oh, man. Sorry, Calvinists. It's looking ugly. It's looking ugly, but we're not done. Mark 10, 18. No one is good, but one. That is God. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Psalm 119, 68. You are good and do good. Teach me your statues. Can you put your hands together for a good God as you return to your seats? That being clarified, that the Lord is indeed good and not the author of evil, Calvinists cannot get around if and remain. So God is good. He isn't evil, which means if you're a Calvinist, you're wrong. Sorry. Sorry. And you can't just dance around and say, well, what we would consider evil is just because we met. I'm done. We're going to move on to the next issue. Calvinists cannot get around the if and remain. Now, I recently heard a prominent Calvinist say this is, this is called dancing around the issue, dear children. This is called dancing around the issue. I recently heard a pro prominent Calvinist say that the word if is not a future conditional. It's a past conditional. And now you're telling me that you've got You've got different English. Uh, dude, this is wild. Any, okay, let's break this down. This is a problem for a few reasons. Number one, he is claiming that Paul is saying that if you're a Christian, then you will continue in the faith. But that's not true because that's not even the context of what's being said in this passage. The conditional is not on being called a Christian. The conditional is on the state of your relationship to God not your continuance. The subject is your relationship to God, not the continuance. So you've completely got the context wrong. And by the way, this guy is an expert. This guy is a doctor. Come on, man. And this is why, guys, look at me, look at me. Or as pastor says, look at you right here. This is why you don't just trust the title. This is why you don't just trust the size of the church. This is why you don't just trust the little plastic card in the wallet that says ordained minister. You read your Bible, you line it up with the word, and you figure out what they are anchored to. Because you'll mess around, you'll find a pastor that's a doctor with a large church and a reputable ministry who's teaching garbage like this. I will continue. Paul doesn't say remain if. He says if indeed you remain, meaning that Paul is saying 
You were an enemy. Now you're a friend if you remain in relationship to him as are our relationships in life. Yes, you're my best friend. If you continue behaving like it. Yes. We are in a romantic relationship. We dating. You're my girlfriend. You're my boo. As long as you act like it. Because if you act like you're for the streets. You feel me? And that goes both ways. That's how relationships work. Why do you think faithfulness is a demand? Do you know what faithfulness is? It's the continual nature of relationship. Christians have always been defined in God's eyes as those who are faithful. What does it say? It says good and faithful servant. How can you be a faithful servant if your continuation was before? Don't you know the wicked and lazy servant that was cast out came in as a servant and left as one who was wicked and cast out? He came in a servant just like the good and faithful ones. Who were the ones who got to inherit the kingdom? The good and faithful, not the wicked and lazy. Don't play these games what are we doing the second reason that it doesn't work the conditional is not modified by the subject but by the modifier I'll explain the modifier here is remain the subject is the state of salvation meaning if I say there's candy for everyone <laughs> whoo, who was that I'll, I'll, get, I'll hook you up with a piece of candy at the end, man. I'm glad. Hey, look. My man was ready for that. I've been waiting all day for that, man. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. No problem, dude. I got you. I got you. But if I said, hypothetically, that there's candy for everyone, if you remain in this room, you don't translate that to mean you've been in this room, so there's candy for you. You don't get to translate that since you've been here, there will always be candy. Because if you ever were in this room, ever, then you would remain and you would never leave it. There are plenty of people who have donned the seats of the church and then left. Now, Calvinists would say they were never saved. And I would say, it's not your flipping business or your job. That's his business and his job. So do your business and produce fruit. That's your job. That'd be silly to say that. Listen, if you leave and you don't remain, you don't get the candy that's available for everyone that remains. Also, that doesn't mean you were never here. If you chose that there was something out there that was better than the candy that I was going to offer you. Even if you were wrong. It doesn't mean you were never here. It just means you didn't remain. So you don't get the candy. Simple concept. You don't have to have a PhD for this. Number three. Bible study shows that he's wrong. How many of y'all have blue letter Bible on your phone? Okay. Why are there anybody in this room that doesn't have that on the, here's your, this is your opportunity. I want you to go to your app store. Go ahead, go to your app store. Download blue letter Bible. Blue letter Bible. Blue letter Bible will make a scholar out of every last one of you, and you ain't got to pay a dime. It's a free app. You don't have to go to school for six, seven, eight, nine. 12 years, some of these doctors of this and that do. You don't got to do that. 
just go to Blue Letter Bible and it'll help you break down the word in a really cool way. I'm going to get geeky with it because you know what? We're talking about a doctor here, right? So fine. Call me Dr. Pepper. Strong's G1487. What is Strong's? Strong's is a concordance. A concordance helps you to be able to see the word in the language that it is written. For example, Muslims go, well, you can't talk about the Quran because you don't speak Arabic. The problem is that you think that the only way that you can figure out the Quran is through Arabic. Why don't you have a tool like Blue Letter Bible that shows you what the original language is so you can identify it for yourself? Might it be because you are being deceived? I don't know. Well, we're just going to hang out here. Strong's G1487 shows us that the Greek word for if, the if, is I, E-I, I, which is a primary particle of conditionality, a.k.a. it is standard conditional, meaning if you do this, you get this. If you do that, you get that. Pretty dang simple, don't you think? Did you ever learn cause and effect when you were a kid? Like, if I roll down the car window while my mom is driving and I throw my favorite toy out of the window, it's never coming back. No, that was just me. I was the only one that did that. Well, okay, cool. Bet. Or if I disrespect my mom, my dad's going to tear my behind up. Also just me? Well, your poor mom. <laughs> Man, I did not want that wrath. I'm, I'm just saying. This is what's crazy to me, that Christians would hold so fast to their doctrinal worldview that they would try to change a two-letter word in the Bible rather than just flipping read it. I, F, it's not complicated. You don't need a D, R, period in front of your name to read F. And you know what's crazy? It was the same thing in Greek. It was still two letters, E, I. This is a warning to every individual in this room. Don't you dare hold so strongly to your doctrinal worldview that you can't even read a two-letter word. It's not future conditional. It's past conditional. According to what? Your idea. Not according to this. This is standard and if you would just read your concordance in Blue Letter Bible, you would know that. Let me make this clear. You are no longer enemies of God marked by sin, but holy and blameless because of Christ's death and resurrection. Three words. If you remain. If you remain. I'll go ahead and have the band come up. Now that we focused on the condition of if, let's look at that word remain, just for clarity's sake. Remember, I said remaining is the key to unlocking the if. Did you write that down in your notes? If you didn't, you should have. What are you doing? I told you, Lewis. Write it down in your notes. I'm just kidding. Lewis always takes great notes. That's kind of why I'm giving him the business. He always takes great notes. There's, there's some people in here where I'm like, hey, can I see your notes? Because I'll be honest, I said that one thing, it wasn't in my notes. And I just want to remember what in the world that was. Because sometimes, I'm not going to lie, sometimes I'm up here preaching and I'm like, yo, that's facts. I wish I could write that down. But I ain't got that kind of time right now. We got we to gotta keep moving, all right? So sometimes I go to like Josiah and I'm like, bro, what, what was that thing? Because that, that was awesome and I need that. I need to keep that in mind because the Holy Spirit be doing his thing, all right? So 
that, that does happen. So if I go knocking on the door, that means I trust your notes. So I might, I might be doing that. Just know. Now, the word for remain is epimeno, epimeno. When I hear remain, there is one verse that jumps off the page to me. This is uh, the passage in John chapter 15, verse uh, four through eight. And in there, we're gonna read it, but in there it says, remain in me and I will remain in you. Now I want, this is a little side note to consider. Remember what I said about that if, right? Remain in me and I will remain in you. Notice will is not past tense, it's future tense. He doesn't say, I did. Just so you know, if you were the elect, if you were the chosen from the beginning of time and you didn't ever get free will, you didn't ever get to choose, that means that God did remain in you. But it don't say that. What does it say? What's the word? Will. It says, I will remain in you. So just some little interesting thought when we go to the other part where it talks about remaining, it's also talking about future conditional. Now let's read the passage after I have my little rant. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit because apart from me, you can accomplish nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, there's the if. If anyone does not remain in me, and we already saw that Jesus puts the condition in the future tense. So in the present tense, who is he talking about? He's talking about those who don't remain. He's talking about us. His audience is those who are already connected. Because he's talking in the tense that says right now, those of you who are already connected, if you don't continue to stay connected. Remember, remain is a continuance. Just like I said before, those who leave the room don't get the candy. You might've been in here. You might've taken great notes. You might've tuned in. But those of you who didn't remain in the room, you don't get the candy. That's the if. It doesn't mean you were never in the room. It means that you left. So what does this passage say about those who don't remain? It says this, he is thrown out like a branch and dries up. How can you become a branch of the vine if you weren't once connected to it? Hmm. Interesting. Interesting that he would use this example. He is thrown out like a branch and dries up and such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and are burned up. If you remain in me, another if, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, including the two letter word, if, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My father is honored by this, that you bear much fruit and show that you are my disciples. Now we looked at the word if, and we looked at the word remain, but there's one more piece to consider here, faith. Faith, if you're taking notes, I want you to write that down, faith. Going back to verse 23a, it says, if indeed you remain in the what? We'll try that again. If indeed you remain in the what? Faith. Bam, got it. If indeed you remain in the faith, established and firm without shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. James chapter two, verse 14 through 26 says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but does not have, oh, you can't say that. We're Calvinists. We don't believe in works. Uh-oh. Can this kind of faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, 
maybe the world kind of has a point when Christians just tweet thoughts and prayers. Christians, maybe they have a point. Maybe they're right. Maybe your prayer is, is ineffective. Maybe your prayer isn't what you think your prayer is because clearly we don't have the heart. We don't have the faith because our faith would be displayed in our works. says, so also faith, if it does not have works, is dead being by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, well, good. Even the demons believe that and tremble with fear. But would you like evidence, you empty fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he, when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that his faith was working together with his works and his faith perfected by works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, now Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness and that he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And similarly, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the strangers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. No works. No works, no James. No James, no Bible. You can return to your seats. This is the if. If you claim that you are a friend of God, why do you still call yourself a sinner? Young person, if you claim that you're a friend of God, why do you still call yourself a sinner? Is it because you're humble? No. It's because for whatever reason, you're still more comfortable with connecting yourself to sin than you are to Christ. If you claim that you remain in him, where's your fruit? Oh, you don't have fruit because it's not the season for figs? Oh no, you see the Holy Spirit produces fruit regardless of the season. And in fact, what I've noticed is that in the driest seasons, the best fruit is produced. Do I have any seasoned saints in the room that can testify? It's in those times where the struggle is real, where you really find out the quality of the fruit and where there's increase in the production of it. If you claim that you have faith, why is it always shifting with every change in the wind and tide? Is life harder than your faith is resolute? was for the disciples. You see, at one point, they were in a boat and they were crossing to the other side of the lake and a storm came up. It was a violent storm and it started rocking the boat and Jesus was just taking a little nap. And they were freaking out. They thought they were gonna die and they were trying to, to save the boat. They were trying to save themselves and they go down and they get Jesus and they're like, Jesus, there's a storm. What are you doing? Just sleeping in the boat. Jesus gets out. I can imagine that he shook his head. I can imagine he rubbed his eyes a little bit as one does when they're woken up suddenly from a nap. He gets out in the front of the boat and he says, peace, be still. And the, the, the storm is calmed. But that wasn't the end of the lesson. The end of the lesson wasn't that Jesus can calm storms. The end of the lesson was their faith was so little that they couldn't. See, it's easy to believe in Jesus when you're on the shore and he's performing miracles. It's hard to believe in Jesus when it's your responsibility to perform one. 
Because usually the need for a miracle doesn't come in an optimal experience. It comes when one is sick or when one is dying. It comes when you don't have the finances necessary or somebody else doesn't have the finances necessary. It comes at a time that's often inconvenient for you and your schedule. But if you're people of faith, it's consistent, then you're always prepared. You're always ready for the work that, that is to come. See, what Calvinists don't get is that the question of if isn't a question of the sovereignty of God. I wanna make that clear. The question of if is not a question of the sovereignty of God. It's not a question of the faithfulness of God. And it's certainly not a question of the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice. The if is a question of your commitment to those things. The if is the question, are you committed to a sovereign God? The question is, are you committed to a faithful God? The question is, are you committed on behalf of the efficacy or a nature that is effective of Christ's sacrifice? Are you? That's the if. See, wavering faith doesn't mean wavering God. It means that he's not your foundation. If you're taking notes, could you write that down? Wavering faith does not mean wavering God. It means he's not your foundation. Wavering faith doesn't mean wavering God. It means he's not your foundation. The Bible tells us a story of the man who built his house on the sand, and that seems like a foolish thing, but many believers have done the same. Because when the tide comes in and things shift, all of a sudden the house is shaken and it almost can't even be occupied anymore. And then we need the Lord to come in and restore it. Come on, anybody seen this or heard this? Maybe this is you personally. God, I'm just praying for restoration for your house that you built on the beach? without concrete? That kind of sounds like a you problem. Because here's the thing, I already provided a cement mixer. His name is Jesus. Because the other part of that story is there was a man who built his house on the rock. And when the storm came, the winds blew, and the tide rolled in, the house was not moved. Our wavering faith isn't about a wavering God. It's about a foundation problem. The if that we're talking about today is this. If your house is built on the right foundation, 